It's going to take me about a minute or two to revive. <laughs> it's not, it's true. It's absolutely true. Well, everybody settled down. It's good to see everybody. See everybody's eyes. That's good. So today, we're going to look at James' epistle. My, my handout was a, kind of a little outline. And James' epistle is a little hard to follow compared to a lot of them. Uh, it's like broken into a lot of little sections. It's almost like Proverbs or the Beatitudes. If you look at it on the surface, he has a lot of little things. And this, this is just a list of uh, the ESV subtitles of all the uh, sections in the book. So, if it does you any good, welcome to it. But that's what we have. Anyway, uh, I thought we might look at this epistle today that James wrote. I have a little outline. Uh, I have to have an outline because my wife always says, I don't know what you were talking about. I need a little outline. So, was that? A, were you making a sign to me? Oh. Uh, so number one is an introduction. Are you guys all right over there? Okay. Number two, to whom was it written? Number three, there are two main spiritual encouragements or principles that James puts forth, and maybe we can see what those are. At least they were main to me. And then four, what are some of the applications of James' book? Uh, James, this letter of James is what they call one of the Catholic epistles. Jim Bog, are you out there? Is it a Catholic epistle? It's not the Catholic Church, by the way. It's general epistle. It's a general epistle to the whole Church of God. And there is a group of six of those Catholic epistles. They're James, 1st and 2nd Peter, Jude, and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. So those are more, you know, Paul wrote to problems. He wrote to, you know, the Corinthians. They had an issue, so he wrote to them. But this is a general epistle. And the James that wrote this is likely our Lord's earthly brother, his older brother. And uh, we don't see, James doesn't seem to have been swept up in the, uh, all this wonderful activity of the Lord when he was ministering there for those three years. Uh, I wonder if he didn't believe in the Lord at that time, if he was too close to home. But uh, we do know that James believed. If you look at 1 Corinthians 15, 7, Paul was talking about uh, who believed and how he, his uh, line of belief. And he said, when the Lord appeared, and then he appeared to James. So we know he did appear to James, and James believed. James was really one of the pillars of the church in Jerusalem. You know, it wasn't real visible, it wasn't a whole lot written about, but he was a pillar in the church at Jerusalem. But he wrote early in the 40s, 50s AD, so he was early in the church. He was before Paul came along. And Scroggy says, James did not step out of Judaism into Pauline Christianity. But to the day of his martyrdom, he represented Christianity within Judaism. So it's a little different. You know, it's a little different perspective. That's number one. Now number two, to whom was it written? And verse one says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed, greetings. And it just really struck me, looking at this, that James considered himself a bondservant. He considered him a bond, self a bondservant. He wasn't serving the Lord out of duty. He wasn't serving the Lord out of ambition. He was serving the Lord out of love. 
he was a bond servant of the Lord. And I just thought, what a great comfort that was to him, knowing he was a bond servant. You know? Could we all be bond servants? What a, it would just be a great encouragement to know we are serving the Lord, clearly and out of love for him. Anyway, this uh, book was written to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Uh, it was uh, the Jews that were dispersed, spread around. Uh, they were st- the 12 tribes. Uh, they were still within Judaism, and they were Christians within Judaism. You know, they were still in the synagogue. So I think they needed some encouragement because they weren't understood in the synagogue for sure, and they were probably... Uh, attacked by the, church, by the uh, world, so they didn't have a home. They were strangers and sojourners here on this earth, and so uh, James was going to encourage them. Strangers and sojourners, does that sound familiar? Who feels like they're a stranger and a sojourner in these evil days? Things just aren't right on this earth, but they're right in heaven. Okay, number three. See, it kind of goes kind of fast because you're supposed to get done in half an hour. So, oops, I opened my notebook. Um, So the first, this is the two spiritual encouragements. So this is number three in the first one, 3A. He, uh, it's, his message is about the encouragement to the saints when they're in trials. He's got a great encouragement for them. You know, I think the last few months for me, four months now, right? Isn't it four months since uh, the president said, we're going to try this for two weeks to see if the virus goes away in two weeks. Didn't work out too well. And then he made it for two months, whatever, I don't know, for an extended period. So we're still living under this sentence of death. But praise God, we have that sentence of death so that the, power, that the power might be of God and not of ourselves. There's great value in this. Um, you know, uncomfortable circumstances can bring us to the end of ourselves, and the things we're under are extended circumstances. And I think that's not without purpose. Paul says, or so used to talking about Paul. James says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So this word endurance, the Lord is after increasing endurance in us. We're we're being trained. He's training us up. It's a great period of training so that we can live beyond our natural capacity, and we can live in the heavenlies. I want to read this, uh, read that passage out of uh, Wiest, that verse I just read. Wiest says, James, a bond slave slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes, those in the dispersion, be constantly rejoicing Consider it a matter of unadulterated joy without any admixture of sorrow whenever you fall into the midst of variegated trials which surround you, knowing experientially that the approving of your faith, that faith having been put to the test for the purpose of being approved and having met the test has been approved, that this approving process produces a patience which bears up and does not lose heart or courage under trials, but be allowing the aforementioned patience to be having its complete work in order that you may be spiritually mature and complete in every detail, lacking in nothing. So these trials, God has allowed these trials, at least for us, there's great purpose in them. You know, the process of lengthy trials we come to the absolute end of ourselves and must call on the Lord. We often think of that, call this as the salvation of the soul. And Psalm uh, 131 is one we all know, but let me just read 131. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. 
My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child my soul within me. O oh, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Like a weaned child with, my, with its mother. He's uh, calling us to wean our souls of our natural environments and just to be at rest on his breast. You know, we're made in three parts. We've said this so often, spirit, soul, and body. And our soul, our natural life, is the thing that causes us so much unrest. And uh, that's the soul that's at rest on the mother's breast. So these trials allow us to uh, come to the end of our natural strength and to trust the Lord. Paul, in 2 Corinthians 12, we're so familiar with, says, Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with my weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. May the Lord give us strength of spirit and increase in that strength of spirit in these days. James 1.4 says, And let steadfastness have its perfect effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The Lord's training us, raising us up. So I have a little story to tell about patience. This last week, uh, we knew that uh, we were going to try and get the children back to their classes this week, and also heard last Sunday that there were yellow jackets on the back ramp again. And I thought, oh, man. So I said, let me try and get somebody out here. I'll try right away. So Monday morning, I called the exterminator and said, when can we get some out to do this? This is the exterminator we've used for years who's sold out to an international company now, and it's, it's totally gone to pot. And I said, when can I get somebody to work on these bees? Well, let me see here. I think about next February. I said, no, can you do better than that? And they, you know, it was almost that bad. I said, how about two weeks? I said, well, that, that isn't good. So we've got a guy that comes out and services our account. He's been out before, and he, he knows how to do it. He suits up, and he takes care of him. OK, let me check around. I'll call you back. I said, OK. So talk about patience. I, I get really upset with bureaucrats, you know. Said, so then she calls me back and said, OK, here's what I got for you. I can have him out there between 8 and 9 on Tuesday, or between 1 and 3, or something like that. I said, OK. How about eight and nine? So I get over here at eight. When I wait for people, I sit out in the dining room at that table and read, and then I can watch the drive and see them coming in. So I wait till eight, then I wait till nine, fifteen, and I said, you know what? I'm going home. No guy, no show. So I got home, my phone rang about eleven thirty. And this kid says, Yeah, I'm over here. I just left to go to voicemail. I didn't take it. So we're getting a new exterminator. So then my oldest son, Matt and Becky, have a guy that worked on bees at their house, country boy that raises bees and knows all about them. So I called him, and he said, hello? I said, uh, yes, I need to get some uh, yellow jackets taken care of. And he said, sure, I can do that. Let me see. Let me look at my schedule. How about? Thursday at 11.30. I said, that's great. So I'm sitting in the window reading a book at 11.30, and it's a no-show. I said, OK. So I called the guy. I said, uh, how about 11.30? Oh, yeah, I'm running late. I'm going to be an hour and a half late. <laughs> OK, well, I said, let's have, let's have a time certain. Let's say 2. He said, OK, 2 o'clock. I'll be there. So I get over here at 1.45. I called him just to make sure. And he said, oh, yeah, I'm on way. I'm going to be there in 12 minutes. He must have had a GPS on his phone or something. I said, OK, I'm waiting for you. 
He showed up. He was here. He had an old pickup truck that was rusting out, and ladders and junk all hanging out the back of it. And he said, so let me show you where I think these things are. So he walked all around the grounds, and he gave me a lot of uh, uh, pointers on maintenance of the property. You know, he, <laughs> while we were on our walk, he told me how I could fill a crack in the concrete, and I need to clean some dirt out somewhere. And I said, OK, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And I came in. And I said, you go ahead and knock on the door when you're done, OK? He said, yeah, I'll do that. I'll get to you. So I'm sitting there reading away. And all of a sudden, I thought he was going to knock the front door down. And I went to the front door. And he had a yellow plastic bag. And he opened it up. And he had the biggest nest of yellow jackets I've ever seen. That thing. You know, it's full of yellow jackets. And he said, you know, I haven't seen one like this in a long time. That's five tiers deep. So it's five layers of yellow jacket nest. And he had his pen. He was all poking in it. And I said, well, those things are moving around. He said, yeah, yeah, they're dead. They just don't know it yet. <laughs> <laughs> I said, OK. Anyway, so the, my patience developed my, my training for the week was learning to wait for the yellow jacket man, but I had great reward. I'm sorry somebody got stung last night. I think he got him out in the middle of the day, so there's probably still some characters out there looking for a place to go. Anyway, those that wait upon the Lord and don't get so stirred up and anxious, reward, great reward. We got a huge yellow jacket nest out of there. OK, so that's a practical application. Sharon said I could give that one. So the, th the third B, 3A, now this is another encouragement that uh, James gives to us. And that is, faith without works is dead. Verse 226 says, for just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. And that's why this book seems kind of weird, you know? We spent our whole lives learning salvation by faith through grace. And James says, uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. How can James stress works? You know, Martin Luther just about lost his life recovering uh, grace, salvation by grace, through faith. And then all of a sudden, he reads this book. He said, it was terrible. It was a straw book. He couldn't fight with it. So it drove him crazy. But you know, the last time I shared, it was out of Galatians. And then when we come to the end of Galatians, it talks about fruit of the Spirit. Uh, we are justified by faith, for sure. We are justified, saved, and made right with God by grace through faith. But after that beginning faith, we are to continue on by faith, walking in the Spirit. And we talked about that. Um, in other words, I think Paul was saying, show me your faith by your works in chapter 5. There ought to be spiritual evidence of our faith as Christians. You know, our... That's part of our testimony. Christ in us, the hope of glory. And that's why Galatians 5 talked about fruit of the Spirit. And I think that's what uh, James is after here. When he says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. And Brother Kong helped me a lot. With this. He talked about the Sermon on the Mount. He says, to be accurate, the Sermon on the Mount is not the Lord Jesus trying to give us a new set of laws. The Sermon on the Mount is the Lord Jesus describing a kind of life which the sons of the kingdom live. So show me your faith by your works. The same thing is true with the letter of James. This is not giving us more laws, more regulations, more rules for us as Christians to keep. 
The letter of James is simply describing to us the kind of life we should live as believers and what good work should be exhibited before the world so that our faith may be proven and perfected. Isn't that the testimony of Jesus? A life, an indestructible life. Got a few minutes here. Uh, so there's faith without works is dead. And what are some applications? So if you look at the outline, the first one I want to talk about, 4A, is freedom from the world. In a time like this, when we're set apart, what can we gain? How can we benefit? And I, want to, and I was going to combine number 8, 9, and 10. Warning against worldliness, boasting about tomorrow, and warning to the rich. And I believe James would have us be set free from the world. The world is a system. It's an evil cosmos. And it is after our souls. It wants to possess our souls. It demands our attention and demands our full attention. Even now, more than ever, all this thing's going on. It wants us to get us involved and caught up with the world. And it's uh, subtle. You know, sometimes we even feel so good about being successful in the world. It gives us a reward. Make us feel good. But it's a system. And we need to be set free from it. And uh, I think this is a time that we have to stop and look back. Get a distance from this world and say, my life is not in this world. My life is in Christ. You know? I'm not, I can't handle it, you know? How many of people can't watch the news anymore? How, 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 many, how many turn the news off? It's disgusting. So you can be like me and just get mad and stirred up, or you can just turn it off and turn to the Lord. So it's a good time to turn away from this world. Not to be ignorant, not to pray and take a stand against what the enemy is doing, but Praise God, we can get free from this world. And then James gives us a little thought on how to handle that. Uh, starting in uh, James 4, verse 4, Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do, do you suppose it is to no purpose that the Scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he's made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace? Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. So this is a time a time set apart to draw near to the Lord. Uh, okay, 4B, another application, comes from uh, number three, hearing and doing the word of God. So in, the, in this time of trial, time of quiet, how important the word of God can be. So chapter 1, verse 19 to 21. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. The implanted word. The implanted word. You know, the word of God is an inheritance. It's a great thing we have, and let's not leave it locked up in the vault. Let's get it out and deal with it. Um, it's a living word. It's not just pen and ink. It's meant to be a living word. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That's the word we want to touch. John 14.1, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. 
it's not the right reference. But anyway, that's the verse. And then uh, Hebrews 4.12, the word is living and active. So we meditate, wait upon God and his word, and be encouraged. These are great opportunities for this living word implanted. Let me read something. I came across that Tozer talks about this. I believe that much of our religious unbelief is due to a wrong conception of and a wrong feeling for the scriptures of truth. A silent God suddenly began to speak in a book, and when the book was finished, lapsed back into silence again forever. Now we read the book as the record of what God said when he was for a brief time in a speaking mood. Tozer can be a little dry. Uh, with notions like that in our heads, how can we believe? The facts are that God is not silent, has never been silent. It is the nature of God to speak. The second person of the Holy Trinity is called the Word. The Bible is the inevitable outcome of God's continuous speech. It is the infallible declaration of his mind for us, put into our familiar human words. I think a new world will rise out of the, of the rigid religious myths when we approach our Bible with the idea that it is not only a book which was once spoken, but a book which is now speaking. If we would follow on to know the Lord, come at once to open the Bible, expecting it to speak to you. Do not come with the notion that it is a thing which you must push around at your convenience. Which you may push around at your convenience. It is more than a thing. It is a voice, a word, the very living word of God. So, trying times, difficult times, we can be in the word and receive with meekness the implanted word. Well, 4C comes from number 12, the prayer of faith. The other thing that uh, a setting apart time can be used for is prayer. So the verses in this section here might talk about intercessory prayer, maybe more uh, public prayer, but what we're talking about is persevering in trials. So we want to talk about personal prayer, learning to pray, learning to draw near to God. Uh, James says in 4.8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Humble yourselves in the presence of God and he will exalt you. Hebrews 4, 14 says, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. You know, I think it's, it's I always think of how good it is to look at how David in the Psalms approached the Lord in prayer. And uh, what David would do in his, in his Psalms when he approached God, the first thing he did is praise the Lord consistently, no matter what his circumstances. So as we praying and approaching the Lord, begin in uh, worship, he always humbled himself before the Lord, bared his soul and humbled himself. And he expressed his belief and abandonment to God and trust in the Lord. And then he always, always poured out his heart before him. Psalm 63, trust in him at all times, O people, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. So Selah, times of trial are times to learn to pray. And hopefully this independent individual prayer would, as time goes on, give us a burden for corporate prayer. You know, corporate prayer, our praying together, we always talk so much about our testimony. Corporate prayer is very much right in the heart of our testimony as an assembly. So, prayer, prayer in the evil time. And the last word, uh, 4D, and I'll just read it. It's from 5, James 5, 19 to 20. My brothers, 
If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wanderings will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So in these times of trial, let's keep out our eyes out for one another. You know, these are days of great trial. And uh, if any among you wanders from the truth, it's so easy to wander, you know. It's easy to be isolated and separated, but let's not let this current virus separate us from one another, and let's keep our eyes and our spirits out for each other. Well, so James has a word for encouragement for those of us on trial. We're in a trial, and I believe he has some encouragements for us. So I'm just going to read two verses that... Uh, to close, and uh, might we be those dr draw near to God and learn the capacity of the, his life in us and his spirit in these days. James 1, 2-4, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Don't let this slip. God has got us in this crucible for training and preparing to grow up in Christ and be prepared for his return. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing, so that we might be mature, grown-up Christians full of the Spirit and the strength of God to stand in the evil day. And I thought it was interesting, uh, Romans 5, 1 to 5. Paul would say something not dissimilar. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exalt in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope, proven character hope, and hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. May we draw near to God and gain perseverance and hope in these difficult days. Lord, we thank you that uh, even though it's perplexing what we see going on, we believe there is a great provision and something to satisfy your heart as we draw near to you. We don't run and hide and try and just get away from everything, but we uh, draw near to you. Would you strengthen us and give us that persevering faith to trust you and grow strong in the Lord and be prepared for your return. In Jesus' name.